Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Hawaii Bill Introduced to Disqualify Trump. This week, um, the Supreme Court gave their ruling uh, whether or not uh, Colorado could remove Donald Trump from the general election uh, using the 14th Amendment, Section 3, uh, as a basis to put him being in the general election. Ballot. And um, that ruling was uh, did not uphold Colorado's request and bill. Uh, additionally, Hawaii, uh, through Senator Carl Rhodes, introduced Senate Bill 2392 to prevent any persons from uh, that met the definition of our, uh, Amendment 14, Section 3, and that's primarily insurrection. Uh, as I looked at Senate Bill 2392, I, I noticed the introduction was very interesting. In fact, it was uh, heartwarming. And uh, it said, um, people have the right to expect public servants to be people of integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, when is the last time we've heard that? And with that, I'd like to go to my guests. With me today is my, my ever famous and faithful co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Senator Carl Rhodes, and our other special esteemed guest, Governor John Wahe. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much Good for attending. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Tim. I promise we'll have a, uh, a fast-paced and interesting discussion and anything's on the table, so don't hold back. Hey, Jake, straight to you. The Supreme Court uh, decided to, uh, to opine and, 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 and offer a ruling on uh, whether or not Donald Trump should be on the ballot. Let's talk about what they didn't touch. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't touch uh, any mention of Trump's involvement with an insurrection. They didn't touch whether or not he qualified as an officer and was that a, was that a provision to prevent him uh, from being pro prohibited from the ballot. They didn't touch whether or not his oath of office was broken or not. And they certainly didn't touch whether or not Donald Trump had received proper due process. So let's talk about what they did touch. Uh, that's the question for you. Hmm, they just went back to Section 5 and said, well, Congress uh, must, must act, uh, even though it's optional in Section 5. And I think, you know, what's uh, was said about that is that it affects the whole 14th Amendment, which by its terms is generally self-executing, and so Section 3 was self-executing. Um, but now, as, as, one, as one fellow suggested to me, we can save ink and we can save trees, because in the future, when we reprint the amendments to the Constitution, we don't have to include this one. It's gone. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, that, that was the, the overreach from the Supreme Court was to uh, mention that it's both houses of Congress will have to uh, remedy Amendment 14, Section 3. But wasn't the primary rationale was that no one state can interfere with the general election as far as uh, the construction of candidates on their ballots? Yeah, I, I think we're concerned, and a, a lot of academics are concerned, that uh, if every state has a, a right to make that determination for a federal office, president, no less, um, then you could have mm, a patchwork of decisions and chaos. Um, but but the problem is, the way the way they left it, you know, um, Section 3 is, is, is gone, and, and it's kind of permanent until some other... Uh, court reverses it. You know, I think this affects the 14th Amendment generally, uh, and maybe other parts of the Constitution. And and certainly, you know, it's a really interesting question as to uh, would they have made this decision um, if they were not conservative? Would they have made this decision uh, if Trump were not running? Uh, would they have made this decision were there not threats of violence if they ruled against Trump? Um, you know, this is a special situation, and uh, I, I judge these things by the man in the street. If you caught somebody uh, at the intersection of Bishop and King and you handed him the language of Section 3 and you said, does this apply? He would say, of course it applies. There was an insurrection. We all saw it with our own eyes. Um, and Trump was in, involved, engaged, and giving comfort. Um, you know, that has been also revealed to our own eyes. And if he is not an officer of the United States, what is he? Um, you know, all of this, it seems very clear to the man on the street. So what you get here 
is something that flies in the face of the ordinary reading of the English language. And the court could not find a way to affirm the Colorado decision, really. Uh, this is a sidestep. And it does tremendous damage, not only the Constitution, but to public confidence in the court. Governor Whitehead, do you agree with uh, Jay Fidel that, uh, do you think they overstepped their boundaries and-, and uh, uh, You know, I, I think, I found it really interesting. And I, and I, I think they were being political. So I, to that extent, I agree with, with, with Jay. In the sense that it's all law that the state can't um, can't uh, affect the federal elections. I mean, that's the reason why in Hawaii, for example, and, and by the way, it was first tested. One of the first states that principle was tested was Hawaii. Uh, the way that it affected Hawaii was that we have a resign to run provision in the Hawaii state constitution. And the one office that the offices that is that's not applied on to other federal offices because there was a ruling very early on that we couldn't do it. I, I'm not so sure that I would go as far. I think that the Supreme Court being very political, I think, but I don't know if I'd go as far as Jay, because what they, they I think what they really were, what they, they said was. By the way, I don't agree with them. Because what they said was that the only person, the only institution that could define uh, <clears throat> an insurrectionist would be Congress. And what that meant essentially was, in my opinion, that the courts couldn't do it. That you wouldn't, you couldn't take somebody to court to prove that they were an insurrectionist. You, you had to take the case to Congress. So what they did was they politicized the 14th Amendment. And that is where I think uh, that is an extremely dangerous person. You know, it was a nine to zero decision based on the, um, that states shall not fragment, um, you know, the federal election process. Uh, and then as far as comedy, uh, excuse me, the Congress providing a remedy, that was more of a uh, five to four split. Were you surprised on the nine to zero? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised because as I said, that's pretty well established law. I was a little. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, to you, Senator Rhodes, um, I noticed that the bill that you introduced did not mention Trump's name at all. Uh, number one, and number two is, um, does is your bill impacted <coughs> by the Supreme Court decision? Oh yeah, it's impacted, no question about it, because we have, we would have it would have applied to both federal and state offices, but the the Supreme Court decision was applies only to federal offices, so. Uh, the bill is still relevant, and there are people out there who could conceivably get caught up in it. Even now, the guy, the guy, I think his name was last name was Oaks, O C O C H S. He ran against Adrian Tam in Waikiki. He was a proud boy. He was at the Capitol on January 6. I believe he was sentenced. I don't remember whether he's still in prison now or not. But there's the possibility that you know, if he came back and tried to run for office, that and he, that's a, that's a a much more cut and dried case because he was actually convicted of activities on that day. Um, whether it was, you know, insurrection specifically, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how that would play out. But that's one reason for having a process is so that you would have judges deciding how it would play out. But it, it's still a relevant bill. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised on the nine to zero decision? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, if you look at the 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 section Article Two, Section One of the Constitution, it it's just a it says each each state shall choose in such manner as, as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So th the founding fathers were certainly not concerned about having like a hodgepodge of stuff. We, we don't even, under the terms of the Constitution, the legislature, we don't even have to let people vote. In fact, the original the original plan was that we wouldn't let them vote, that we would just pick electors and then those electors presumably wise men, because women weren't allowed to vote at the time, um, and and white wise men, and they would choose the president. So this, this whole idea of voting for president, we still don't vote for president, we vote for the electors. So the fact that each state would go its own way, uh, I don't know, that seems fairly clear to me that the original the original intent was that that's exactly what the uh, the, the various legislatures of the states would do is go their own way. Well, it's interesting, um, my handy little book of the Constitution, uh, you know, if you look at Section 3, the last sentence says, but Congress may 
by a vote of two thirds of each house, removes such a disability. The word is may. Yet if you go to section five, it says the following. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. And the word shall is there. So it looks like uh, the Supreme Court basically inserted the language or the verbiage of, of section five to supplant for section three. Your thoughts? Well, I, I think that typically the, the, the way you interpret things like that is the more specific language wins. So the one that's specific to section three, I believe, should apply for section three. And if you think about what, what they're saying is, OK, so Congress has to put in some law to uh, uh, enforce this disability, this disqualification. But then to, un to, to take the disability off in a specific case, they have to pass another law to undo the law that they've already passed. And I just, I don't know. I don't think that's a common sense reading of that provision. I think it's pretty clear that the disqualification is, is, um, is automatic. And then you have to, uh, and then you have to, by a two-thirds vote, undo it if you're going to undo it. Was well, it really? I agree, a I agree vote? with Carl. I agree with Carl. Mm -hmm. The well, language uh, in Section Five says "shall have the power." That doesn't require it, right? Uh, either under that section or any other part of the Fourteenth Amendment to do. And most of the Fourteenth Amendment, if not all of it, is self-executing, and that's the history of of that of that amendment. Um, so I, I don't think there's really a requirement in in that language you read. It only offers uh, Congress the power. On the well, other hand, you know what, what they've done is created a real interesting logical mm, mm, logical problem here because the relief to the disqualification, which I believe is self-executing, um, is that you go back to Congress or you go to Congress for the first time. And you say two thirds vote in each house, and you can be excused from your disqualification. And that's the, as Carl says, that's the specific provision, specific to this um, section three, uh, that should apply. And so if you add in a requirement that Congress act in the first place, and then you you have to abide by the language in the last sentence of section three. You get a real logical, you know. Well, they turned everything backwards. Yeah, yes, they flipped it around. The, the, right. The, yeah, they flipped it around. I mean, that's what it did, and that's how they they, you know, they politicized the system. Now, so they flipped it around. Now you need two thirds vote to be excluded, as opposed to be placed back on. So. Well, not only that, but didn't no, didn't the no, Supreme Court decision? You need a majority vote to be excluded, excluded. under their interpretation. And then you need a two-thirds vote um, to be excused from the exclusion. Um, so, it, you know, it's really a strange situation. And, and of course, you, you have the, um, the problem of the uh, – we were talking about this yesterday, Tim um, – the problem of the filibuster, right. which changes the way that vote works. Can you explain that, Tim? Well, for, a, for in the Senate, if a bill is to get onto the floor, um, you, just need, you just need 40 senators – to, to introduce the concept of uh, a filibuster. So you've created a supermajority by, by that Senate rule. Um, and then you need, I believe it's 60 senators to override the filibuster, if I'm not mistaken. So they've added some complexity on how uh, the Senate at least would be able to remedy this, this issue um, by adding, because we have a standing filibuster rule in place. I was just thinking, though, that, uh, you know, the, the complexity at the congressional level will, will be playing itself out. But I think the court was politicizing the process. Nevertheless, I think the, this bill that the senator introduced here in the legislature still has some validity for Hawaii, uh, you know, on, on several levels. Um, and, 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 you know, it would be interesting to see how we would apply it. But... Um, you know, the world's getting more and more crazy. So we we have, as he pointed out, we have our own patriot boy that was convicted. And if he tries to run again, this is a statute that you would do it. I mean, we don't need to follow it. We don't need the opposite of what the, the, nine, the nine to zip rule was, is that the state can do what it wants with its, its election short of violating, I guess, equal protection and due process. So we can. Yeah, well, we, 
And we, and we have a very recent history of interpreting a very similar position very differently. There was a, I've forgotten that name of the case, but there was a gun case that came down from the, the Hawaii Supreme Court. Recently. Hawaii versus Christopher Wilson. Christopher Wilson, yeah, that's right. And uh, they, in the, the Hawaii Supreme Court said, hey, you, you know, our, our, the language in our constitution uh, about guns is almost exactly the same as the Second Amendment. There's some punctuation and some capitalization differences that don't really have any effect on the meaning. And the, our, our Supreme Court interpreted it quite differently and actually took into account the fact that the word militia is in there and said, it, you know, that guns have to be connected to a militia. So it wouldn't it would it would not be a surprise if we interpreted the whole thing quite differently. I would love to see that for one. I would love to see the same kind of analysis where the state Supreme Court effectively rejected the United States Supreme Court decision in, was it, Bruin? And um, that would be a wonderful thing. And we'd be very stiff-necked, we'd be reversed, um, but we would be making a statement for the world uh, that the fellow on Bishop and King, his reading of this language should apply. Uh, and I, 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 I think that the way that we get back into the federal issue, though, is the fact that the senator's bill really didn't, for example, didn't talk about the candidate. The senator's bill uh, focuses on the behavior of the electors, which, you know, I think that's going to be a very close call whether those, whether electors ultimately, as you pointed out, Senator, creatures of the federal system or of the, um, of the state. So, well, you may not be able to exclude Trump from the ballot, for example. I, I, I wonder how the—I think the issue is still alive as to the behavior of the electors if your bill passes. I don't yeah, know. That's a, that, that's a very good question. And because we don't directly vote for the president, we vote for electors. Um, having said that, though, of course, it has—the federal courts have ruled that we can enforce the faithless elector rules. So— we passed a bill a year or two ago that says if you said you were going to vote for uh, Donald Trump, you have to vote for Donald Trump if he were to win the state. Uh, I don't. I just don't know how the, that all. Well, your bill amends that section by saying unless, unless they are, you know, insurrectionists or whatever. Exactly. The, so the it's, language it's is. still. So. It's there's still some interesting questions there for sure. Uh, Senator Rhodes, to what degree uh, did your Senate bill have support? Has that crossed over to the House as yet? It did cross to the House a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there were some no votes in the in the Senate. I've forgotten how many. It wasn't uh, it, it wasn't particularly close vote. But in, in the Senate, of course, if there's any no votes, that's somewhat noteworthy. So there's some resistance to it. How how was public testimony on on your bill? Uh, my recollection, it was almost entirely opposed because the Republicans hate it, um, and they're and they're very well organized. So they they come in and and flood you with uh, with uh, opposing testimony. Mm -hmm. Did they uh, cite specific grounds why they're opposed to it? I mean, I, I I really loved how you the the introduction of your bill. Again, I'll read it again. The people have the right to expect public servants to be people of integrity. I I love that. And I think that should be on every bill. <laughs> So was, what, what specifically do they oppose your bill? I, I think the, 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 the most common claim was you're taking away the right for me to vote for who I want to. And my response to that is, well, there are several, there are several things, the, there are several qualifications to run for president. You have to be 35, you have to be a natural born citizen, whatever that means, and you have to have lived in the United States for 14 years. And you have to not have, until a couple of days ago, you, you had to have not been involved in an insurrection. So, you know, it's just, it's not, it wouldn't be me taking away your right to vote. If you don't meet the qualifications to run, you don't meet the qual qualifications to run. Are you disappointed that the Supreme Court didn't take up uh, whether or not Donald Trump was, uh, um, uh, as the finding of facts of Colorado, that Donald Trump had participated in insurrection? Are you, are you disappointed that they didn't take that particular issue up? I don't know if disappointed is the right word. I, it's a real gnarly uh, factual issue. And normally, in a, with a fact pattern that difficult, you would, it would have come up through um, a trial court, basically, and you'd have a record on appeal, and then you could decide from there. Uh, it is kind of, an, kind of an unusual situation for the Supreme Court to just—I mean, they had a record from Colorado. 
they, but it, it's it's not. There, there's they had a, a hearing. Of, they had a hearing. They had a hearing, uh, but it an evidentiary hearing in front of Judge court. Wallace there in the court. Sure. Section three doesn't say anything about conviction. It just says you can't right. have participated. Yeah, but I think they, they they did in fact take it up. They just did it by sleight of hand. And what uh, they did was that you couldn't. Mm -hmm. What they decided was that you the, that a court couldn't decide that issue. So it didn't matter what the record was. Or it didn't matter what happened or what's in the thing. <laughs> and that I think, or at least they. They suggest it. Now, I don't know if the court's going to hold that line or that strict a line, but in this, in their decision, they, they're basically, uh, as I said, politicized because they remove the decision from a court, from any kind of hearing, from any kind of process, and just placed it with, the, uh, with Congress. Let me ask you this, because, uh, Jay, you and I talked about this uh, yesterday, and that was um, what would prevent potentially 50 states from coming up with different findings of fact about the definition of insurrection. Um, would that be chaotic, at least? Uh, Governor Waihe. Well, well, you can, yeah, well, I, I, yeah, that would be chaotic. And, but it never, that potentiality never really, really happened. You see, they, 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 there's some, there's a little flawed logic in the Supreme Court decision. I mean, first of all, the basic unanimous holding was, in my opinion, old, uh, old precedent. And they could have just said that. They could have just stopped there and said, well, you know what? You guys shouldn't have anything to do with federal elections. You want to do this for yourself, you do it. So, like, if you're going to run a primary election and use state money, maybe you might have something to say about it but, or whatever. But they reached... And they went beyond the fact that this is a federal election and the state ought not to be interfering in it. And then they suggested which among the federal players should have anything to do with it. And, and that, to me, was where you get where things start to get shaky, because they're, not, they're no longer really deciding the issue. They, they are, in fact, giving Trump a remedy. Which is like, you know, if this is ever to happen to him, you got to make sure that uh, Congress voted on. Well, you had mentioned that um, they got into the politics of the issue. And let me just kind of remind everybody what uh, Do uh, John Roberts said. Um, this is a message to Americans that they should take home. Um, Barrett said, Barrett Jackson said, not a, this is not a time to ramp things up, but to kind of cool things down. So they were concerned about the outcome of their decision, and they did dip their toes in the politics of it versus what I would think is the strict law of it. Uh, yeah, well, they did it with subterfuge, though. It was very sub I mean, they didn't do it straightforward. It was, it, it was very clever. Mm -hmm. And they, they kind of turned it what would have been a tradition, uh, another traditional uh, interpretation on its head. Because as as the uh, Sotomayor pointed out in her dissent, basically, they removed the court. They seem to have removed the courts from the process. So there's no way for me to challenge Donald Trump and his uh, insurrectionist uh, heritage, except to take it to Congress. The whole idea that somehow they're gonna, they they want to tamp down the the divisiveness in the country is just a joke. I mean, they just baldly overturned Roe v. Wade, what, a year and a half ago. And the Supreme Court in the recent past has gotten directly involved in politics with Bush Gore. So, I, you know, yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. Crocodile tears. Good point. And you'll see point. On, we, have a, we have a hearing coming up on the immunity case. You know, the argument for the Supreme Court is set on, um, I think it's April 25th, on the immunity case. And we're going to see what kind of questions they ask and take their temperature on that one. It, if they wanted to tamp down the, the to take care of that question, they should have taken it up when Jack Smith asked them to in December. So I mean, there it's pretty clear. I mean, it it's a very plausible explanation that they are going along with Trump's plan to stall everything by just dragging it out and dragging it out. So, but they didn't drag this one out. So I, I don't know. I think they're they're hope. I think I agree with Governor Wahe that they're they're being very political. Well, I think the, the the result is actually worse than 
that this that this moment, you know, of dealing with the Colorado case and Illinois and New Hampshire and what might have been Hawaii, um, I think I think you have to consider that this election coming up, which is now clearly going to be a re a rematch between uh, uh, Trump and Biden, uh, is probably going to be pretty close, and it's possible, as it was last time, um, that people will see the truth, see the light. And they will vote against Trump, and the result will be a close election where Trump loses. <clears throat> and what do you think? Is he going to do exactly the same thing? Is he going to deny the results of that election? Is oh, he going to try to manipulate the process? Is he going to try to do some insurrection? Well, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is not available to stop him or to hold him accountable if he does that. I was going to say, I think the answer is yes. He, he is going to. He's going to do exactly the same thing. Only he's had a he's had a trial run to last time. I, I don't. Um, I mean, the, the, the reason. I mean, he's very personally motivated. He's been indicted ninety one times, and he thinks his best chance of getting out of all those criminal indictments is to be in power. And and he thinks he'll be able to stop those investigations. Well, he might be able to. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's a foregone conclusion. But that's that's why he's so interested in winning this race. He doesn't want to go to prison. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that this race with Trump is is like a survival race, which you know I I, I don't know whether the sometimes courts tend to do something like this, and especially political court, and that is they they keep giving a little bit and a little bit. They're doing everything they can, but at the end. I think the court's going to hold that he is uh, going to be liable for criminal conduct. But they're going to make it, they might throw in at best some sentence, but not while he's in office. You know, something like that. And and just give him every break they can to see whether he's going to win the election. I love, if he did win the election, we're going to be having a discussion when the, when this, when there's going to be a, a decision about whether or not we should amend the Constitution and allow for a third term. Well, what about the question that was asked to his attorney whether or not uh, a political assassination of his uh, opponents would be justified and would he be uh, in a position to be prosecuted? And um, according to the attorney, the answer was pretty much no. Yeah, um, no, at least not while he's in office. He's claiming absolute immunity. He says that no president can function without absolute immunity, even though every single president up to this point has functioned without absolute immunity. Well, you know, I think it's entirely possible that this court, having revealed themselves in so many cases already, um, will find some immunity for him. How much? Don't know. But the way they frame the question is, uh, does he have immunity and to what extent and so forth? It's going to be a grayscale on this one. But let me, let me go back to your bill, Carl. <clears throat> your bill, you know, gut reaction, as soon as you see the, the case, the Supreme Court's action a couple of days ago, uh, you say, well, Carl Rhodes' bill is done. It's no longer important. It's no longer, you know, going to happen. And as you said, the Republicans oppose this because they don't want your bill. They, they, they like insurrection. I don't know. Uh, they, anywhere close to insurrection, they like, they like that. But so, but as a matter of fact, real politic, uh, what are the chances now, in view of this this uh, Supreme Court decision, that your bill will pass? Um, and if it doesn't, what does that mean for Hawaii? If it does, what does that mean for Hawaii? Well, I, I mean, it's, as we discussed before, it's still clearly relevant because the the, the, court, the court case, the U.S. Supreme Court case that was just decided, says it only applies to federal electors, so our elections. So, on the state level, it would be a good it would be a good idea whether we anticipate any insurrections in the near future or not. It's always good to have a process in place before uh, before the event happens. Having said that, you know, I mean, I, I think it does make it a lower priority bill in the House. It's it's viewed as controversial. I, I I kind of I've always kind of chuckled at that because all it's trying to do is follow the terms of the Constitution, and when following the terms of the Constitution become controversial, we have a problem. But uh, you know I don't know real politic. I I just don't know. The bill is not dead yet, but is it a priority compared to line of fires to you know a whole host of other issues that we're dealing with? I, I don't know. We'll see. 
But there is a there is a kind of hidden issue in there for Hawaii though, and and uh, and that is what is the definition of an insurrection. I mean, what do you do? Uh, how does the law apply to somebody, let's say, like Bumpy Kanaheli, who is openly and uh, declared that he has his own nation, for example, or any of the Hawaiian nationalists and sovereignists? Would this no, mean that it can be, uh, you know, or is there a kind of Hawaiian exception? Now, there's no, there's no Hawaiian exception in in the bill as currently drafted, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fair question, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, it all depends on what the definition of insurrection is, and I, I, I was of the opinion that I probably wouldn't be able to figure that out on my own, and that's why we punted it to the Hawaii Supreme Court. But I, um, but I do think this whole the whole it's actually more relevant than people think right at the moment. I think because if if Trump is reelected, and that's not beyond the realm of possibility, I, I think. That there is a, it, it is possible that the United States will start flying apart. Yeah, me too. I be, I think so. If if that happens, then I would think that Hawaii, there was going to be a real strong movement in Hawaii, in particular, which of course was an independent nation not that long ago, to fly with it. And then you know, does the does the insurrectionist clause apply to the United States, or does it apply to Hawaii as a new nation? I, I don't know. Probably again, probably. Or wow. Texas. Texas is going to fly maybe faster than Hawaii. I mean, they want to fly. They've got more sovereignists there, probably, than they do. They have more guns, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. We got more We got more guns than people. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay, that's yeah. that's not good people. to know. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, one of the Republican initiatives um, we haven't talked about is Article 5 of the United States Constitution allows for just as the Hawaii Constitution allows for, a constitutional convention. Okay, you have a certain vote of a certain number of states and all that, and then presto, there's a, a convention to change the Constitution, the United States Constitution. The Republicans want that. I think they have a lot of reasons to want that. But the fact is, a lot of people in this country are really, they do not understand and they don't particularly, you know, accept various provisions of the Constitution, including Donald Trump. And you mentioned before, Carl, that he may want another term after. You know, he may want to be an FDR and have lots of lots of terms. Right. And this is old. one way to get there. He's pretty old too. I think he's only three years younger than Biden, so I'm not too worried about that. Although he doesn't drink or smoke, which um, that does <laughs> that does help. Well, yeah, what I'm saying he's... is that is that you talk about the the country flying apart, going fragmented. A, I think the country is already coming apart on the rule of law and on respect for the Constitution and the courts and so forth. And Congress is locked up. We all have to admit that. So that, you know, uh, Article I, I, 5 would be, would step into the breach. Article 5 would be a, a real chaotic experience, as it would be uh, for a constitutional convention in the state of Hawaii, which is coming in, what, two or three years, right? Well, if we, if we, if we want one. No, I, I, I've always actually, this is a, I'm pretty liberal, but I actually part company with my liberal friends on, on an Article 5 convention. I mean, the way it's set up, you have to have, uh, I forget, it was three quarters or you know, a whole bunch of states have to agree to do it. But I say, let's go in there, change the Second Amendment to be some reasonable thing, fix up, get rid of the Electoral College, which is just ridiculous at this all point. All the stuff about slavery, you know, get the... Yeah, right. get rid of all that stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff that needs fixing, and I don't, you know, I'm not I'm not as afraid of an Article 5 convention as a lot of my liberal allies are. My, I used to fight with my father about this all the time. It's like, well, what, what are we losing, Dad? I mean, it's like, we, we can control the outcome because you have to have a supermajority to approve it, whatever the outcome is, and let's go in and fix some stuff. But yeah, that, that's probably a, that's probably a nutty. And I, I've been All carrying right. on that same discussion with people on the local uh, having another convention. Yeah, very local. true. Hey, we've run out of time, so I'm going to go around the table and ask for your last thoughts. Uh, Jay, I'll start with you. I'm I'm very sad because this uh, reveals uh, more about the Supreme Court. I think it uh, telegraphs what they're going to do on the immunity case, uh, and I think it undermines public confidence uh, in them, just as it did in the, in the Dobbs case. Uh, so what you have here is um, a, sorry, a plain language statement 
in Section 3 of Article of, of the 14th Amendment. Um, and the average person can say, gee, what happened? They, they, they shunted that to the side. Uh, is, is that good law? When, when it says it in English, I believe in the language of English, um, and, and here we are, you know, uh, arguing, as, as has been argued over the past few months, um, these arcane um, decision points. I, I agree, uh, uh, John Wai, hey, that it's a clever thing what the Supreme Court did, but it is not a thing that protects us from dictatorship. It is not a thing that protects us from an autocrat who would undermine the whole Constitution and civil rights. So they call that political if you want, but I think it's it's real. Um, and I would I would want to uh, you know uh, uh, affirm the Colorado decision simply to keep a president out who has been directly and demonstrably involved, if not a planner, um, of the uh, insurrection. Uh, so uh, what happened here is we bypassed all of that, and we may suffer it again. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, Governor, Governor Waihe, your, your final thoughts, please. Well, uh, as we used to say when I was in the legislature, I don't, I don't know if they still do it, but I'd like to add those passionate remarks uh, on to, uh, as my remarks on the record, you know, except I would change the word clever to diabolical. But other than that... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that's where appreciate I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, um, Senator Rhodes. You get the final word on this topic. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I, um, you know, I, it, it, I don't think the population in general and, and and in Hawaii either is is taking the whole insurrection thing seriously enough. I mean, Donald Trump has been indicted on criminal charges ninety one times. Prosecutors don't take on former presidents if they don't think they've got the goods on you. If I were on a jury, I would have to look at the, the record before me and decide accordingly, but I'm not on a jury. I get to look at the whole record about everything that we know about this, this instance, and we can't, I, I don't know how long the democracy survives if we ignore the kinds of things that happen on January 6th. All righty, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel. I would like to thank our special esteemed guest, Governor Waihe. And I would like to thank Senator Rhodes for your participation this afternoon. And thank you for your very sage and wise comments. Uh, I'd, like I'd, to like to th I'd like to thank Senator Rhodes for putting that bill in. Thank here, you. Here. For me too. That was a mark of courage. He's, he's, he's got a few good bills uh, dealing with elections that I hope people pay attention. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, Thanks. here, here. Um, I'd like to conclude and echo Senator Rhodes. Uh, again, I fell madly in love with the introduction to Senate Bill 2392, and I'll repeat it again because it's worth repeating. And that is, as we head towards the general presidential election in 2024, people have the right to expect their public servants to be people of integrity. So let's all remember that as we move forward. And until then, I, this is Tim Apicella with American Issues Take One. Won't you join us next week? Aloha.